All right, everybody, open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Genesis, chapter 2. And um, as you're turning, let me say, as I said in our church hour, if you're watching at home, um, you'll get a much better instruction, and I think it'll be much more effective for you if you study with us and turn in your Bible along with us here at church. And um, that way you can see things on the pages of your own Bibles rather than just watch and have someone else uh, list it all for you or narrate it for you. Genesis chapter 2. And let me point out two verses there. Verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. I mentioned this maybe last week or the week before about the subject of the fruit of the garden. What was the forbidden fruit God had commanded against in the garden? And uh, someone had posted a comment uh, under one of our videos about that subject. And so I thought, well... I might have hinted that we would study it soon, so let's do that. And then, God willing, next week we will take up another book of the Bible and begin to study that, however long that might take us. But um, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. The Bible tells us what we are supposed to do, study. It tells us why we're supposed to study, to not be ashamed and to be approved of God. And then it tells us how we're supposed to study, by rightly dividing the word of truth. We're told for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, and line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, Isaiah 28, verse 10. Paul says our job is to be comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. Christ said that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, may every word be established. Matthew 18, verse 16. The believer is expected to compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures. Peter writes that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And if the conclusion that that believer comes to, <clears throat> or he arrives at, is considered strange, maybe even outrageous, by your average Christian who's not much of a Bible student, that's their problem. You go with the Word of God no matter where it takes you. And so I want you to see some things uh, on the pages of your own Bible today. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15 and first of all, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Everyone is in Adam simply by being born. But not everyone is in Christ until they're born again. All right? Notice verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, that'll be Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Keep your finger here. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 5 this time. Genesis 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Now I'll jump forward to Matthew chapter 1. Keep your finger there in 1 Corinthians 15. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Only those two men 
have those similar introductions in the scriptures. The distinctions between Adam and Christ and the comparisons between them can't be ignored in the Bible. One man brought sin. The other man brought salvation from sin. One brought a curse to the earth. The other is going to bring a new earth. One brought about death. The other brought about eternal life. Now back to 1 Corinthians 15 and begin there at verse 50. 50 through 52. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, stay dead, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You don't get forgiven and promised glory in heaven automatically. You need those things given to you by God. And these mortal bodies need to be changed if you ever want to live in glory forever. Uh, let me point out something real quickly here. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There is a marked difference between the phrase the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And uh, people who don't believe in rightly dividing the Bible tend to think, well, those are two synonyms. They simply refer to the same thing, sort of the presence of God in my life. But that is false. Paul just said that, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And you'll find uh, many Christians who believe that one day Christ is going to rule over the earth and have a literal physical kingdom to reign over. Ask them, are there some people who will endure to the end and not worship the Antichrist, not receive his mark, who will escape Christ's wrath when he returns and thus enter into the kingdom of Christ in their physical bodies? to which they'll probably agree and say yes. Well, if the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are simply synonyms for the same thing, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Because there's, those are some people who inherit the kingdom of heaven in their physical bodies, simply by being obedient during the tribulation. So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are two different things. Paul says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Those are physical things. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, Romans 14, verse 17. The Lord Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, physical things, shall be added unto you, Matthew 6, verse 33. But you don't need to turn to all of these next texts, but write them down as I cite them for you. Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Luke 22, verse 44. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. John 19, verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Christ's blood uh, was said to be God's blood. Colossians 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. By the way, those three words, through his blood, are missing in all of the modern translations. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. 
For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, now notice the description of Christ after he rose back to life. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. I'll give you a moment to find it. Luke 24 verse 39. Christ said, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Christ had shed his blood on the cross for the sins of the world. So he described himself now as flesh and bones. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2 again. Genesis chapter 2. See how Adam describes himself before sin entered into the picture. Genesis 2, verse 23. Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Adam was a type of Jesus Christ. That means Eve had to be a type of the body of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ, which she is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. So she certainly is a type of the bride of Christ. How does the Apostle Paul describe us as the bride of Christ? Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 30. Ephesians 5, verse 30. For we are members of of his body, notice, of his flesh, and of his bones, just like Adam and Eve. What does all this have to do with the fruit of the garden? Well, it's all necessary because the identity of the forbidden fruit ends up being connected with the element of human blood that enters into the story. Run, if you will, to Genesis chapter 49. Say, why are you having us go all over the place? Because it's necessary to answer the question. Genesis 49, notice there verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Go forward to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. Here God is reviewing Israel's success once they reached the promised land. Deuteronomy 32 verse 14. Butter of kine and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Question Is it possible that grapes were the forbidden fruit of the garden? Uh, someone posted a comment under my remarks a couple weeks back. Um, saying that grapes don't grow on trees, they grow on vines. Here, the Bible is allowed to define its own vocabulary. And you and I have to accept it. Amen. Go, if you will, to Ezekiel chapter 15. Ezekiel 15, 
Notice there, verse 2. Ezekiel 15, verse 2. Ezekiel 15, verse 2, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Eve replied, but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, thou shalt not eat of it, so forth and so on. The vine, then, is counted as a tree, so it can be considered in our search. Turn, if you will, to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. In number 6, we're given the ground rules for someone who wanted to take a vow of separation unto God, called the vow of a Nazarite. Could be a man or a woman. For some period of time, they would say, I want to draw closer to God uh, and separate myself only for the worship of God. And God said, all right, I want you to do these things for that period of time. Notice number six, verses three and four. He shall separate himself from wine, that's from the grapevine, and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, or dried, those would be raisins. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. So not only was the grapevine counted as a tree, but it's the only fruit that was later forbidden in the Bible, here in Numbers chapter 6. And it indicates the difference between obey, obedience and disobedience, as God set up the, the rules. So far, we see Adam before sin entered, and Christ, after sin was conquered, were both described as flesh and bones. Eve was described as flesh and bone of Adam. The church, the bride of Christ, is described as flesh and bone of Christ. The word blood isn't used in any of those texts. The juice in the grape is described as blood. They drink the pure blood of the grape. Uh, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, and so forth. The grapevine is also called a vine tree in the Word of God. And it's the only fruit or the only tree that was forbidden later in the Word of God. Let me add a couple more observations to this study. When they ate of the forbidden fruit, the Bible says, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. There in Genesis chapter 3. It caused them to see things differently than they had seen previously. Solomon warns against drinking wine, saying, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Of course, all of that leads to nakedness eventually these days. After Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord God slew an animal in the garden and made coats of skins, to cover them, Genesis 3, verse 21. When a Nazarite violated his vow and he broke his oath to God, he was to offer sacrifices, including the offering of a lamb to make atonement for his sin. So the parallels are very striking. I was looking at a list down in my office earlier this morning of the similarities between Adam and Noah. And uh, among those similarities, you have things like each man, and I gave the scripture references for, for each point in both men's cases, uh, each man was considered the father of the world 
in his respective time. Uh, each man was given dominion over the earth. Each man had three sons, at least three sons whose names were given in the Bible. You had, you know, Cain, Abel, and Seth, and uh, Japheth, Shem, and Ham in Noah's case. Each man had the animals brought to him. You read that text carefully. Noah didn't go scramble around trying to catch two of every kind, right? They came to him. And uh, each man's sin was connected to his nakedness somehow. Adam's case, Noah's case. His son um, Ham saw the nakedness of his father Noah in the tent. And each man's sin had to do with putting something in his mouth to bring it about. In Adam's case, it was eating the forbidden fruit. In Noah's case, it was drinking and getting drunk with wine, which comes from a grape. Uh, and the most telling similarity is that each man was told to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In Genesis 9, it's obvious that the word replenish means to refill because God had just wiped out everyone else. When God told Adam to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, it's because he must have wiped out a civilization before Adam. This is what's, this leads into the subject of the gap, and there's not a lot of strong scripture to prove it, but there's enough um, circumstantial scripture to make the case for it. And this is what we believe. But we don't dwell on it because there's, it's sort of tenuous. There's not a lot of stuff there to grab onto. And that has nothing to do with your salvation anyway. But the similarities between Adam and Noah are very telling. And both of them put something in their mouth they shouldn't have, which led to their sin. Uh, and it was connected with their nakedness. But So let's say that their blood came to them once they ate of the forbidden fruit God had forbidden. God had told them not to. And that that fruit was a grapevine tree, using the Bible's vocabulary. What was in their circulatory systems before that day, before that time? That's a question that's worth asking, and can we find the answer to it? I think we can. Turn quickly to the book of Exodus, chapter 7. There may be some elements of this, some questions that I leave unanswered if you're watching this at home later on this week. So uh, forgive me if I didn't cover all the bases, if there's something that slipped my mind. But um, I promise you, I'm the only guy teaching this today. You won't be learning anything like this at Calvary Chapel. Genesis, or rather Exodus 7 and verse 20. And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river and in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the rivers were turned to blood. Go to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, notice what Moses says in verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That's God confirming what Moses just prophesied. Run, if you will, to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2, notice there verse 3. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Verse 7, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Verse 9, 
when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Verse 11. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Moses said God would raise up a prophet like himself. And when the Lord, when, when John the Baptist came in the wilderness preaching the coming of the Messiah, uh, the Bible says they asked him, Art thou that prophet? And he said, No. But they were anticipating one that Moses had predicted. Jesus was that prophet. And Jesus' first public miracle was to turn water into wine, a type of blood. Run back to 2 Samuel 23. 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23, and let's begin there at verse 14. And David was then in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. That was David's hometown. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof and poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. How can I treat their safety so carelessly by drinking the water they bring to me when it might have cost them their lives in getting it? But he saw it as equivalent to the blood of the men who risk their own lives to go through the enemy's line and bring back water for the king. So water is seen as a type, as a precursor to blood in the word of God. Now, this is all why we teach here that the fruit of the garden, the forbidden fruit, was a grapevine tree. And you don't have to violate any text of the Bible. You use the vocabulary that's given to you in the Word of God. Now, the question may come up, and this question occurred to me years ago as I was poring over this. Let's suppose I accept all of that, that the grapevine counted as a tree, and therefore it could be the tree that was forbidden in the garden. Where did the animals get their blood? I'll give you the best answer that I think can be given. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll finish this up. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 38 says, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and every seed his own body. Verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. If there is a difference between the body of a man and the body of a horse or a dog or any other animal, then it's you have to assume there must be a difference between the blood that circulates inside them. As far as I know, you cannot transfuse blood from an animal into a human being or vice versa. And yet the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. So the blood of that flesh is different than the blood of our flesh. And we don't read that the animals sinned and were kicked out of the garden. We read about men sinning with animals. That was commanded against in Leviticus 18. Perversion and bestiality of every kind. 
Jude talks about them going after strange flesh in his book. The wickedness of man knows no depths. It, 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 and the uncleanness of men knows no limit. So I can only say that if there's a difference in the flesh and the structure of the animals versus those of men, there must be a difference in the, the function and the utility of the blood in their bodies uh, compared to ours. And there's no reason to think, well, they must have eaten the forbidden fruit. That's just, you're, you're going way beyond the scripture to come up with that theory. What I just gave you, there is no absolute one single concrete verse that says the man and the woman had blood in their uh, arterial system prior to eating the fruit. But if you compare the language of the verse here with the verse there and the verse there and the verse there, I don't know how many verses we just looked at to build the case, then there is more than circumstantial evidence. You can lay a, a great foundation for a conclusion, which I trust that we did today.